So uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm super excited for, for being here. And I will do the trick that Sean did. So thanks for that. I'll put my this, this blog post link so where you can find all of the resources that I used for this talk, papers and documentation where Merkle trees are used in production in real life. So um, first of all, I'm, I'm Pedro. Um, I'm from Portugal. I work at a company called Talkdesk, and I kind of tweet a lot. Um, so feel free to, to see my tweets. And the cool thing is that I run a meetup in, in, in Porto, in Portugal, uh, called Papers We Love. For those who doesn't know what Papers We Love is, is a repository of academic computer science papers. And we build a, f a full community uh, who loves reading um, computer science papers. So as you can see, there's lots of chapters around the world. And yeah, it's, we have one in Porto. We read papers uh, monthly. And at my company, we, we start to read them um, two and two weekly. Um, so yeah. So th the topic for this talk came up in, um, in a reading session back in Porto. And we, we read this, this paper, um, a digital signature based on a conventional encryption function. It was written by Ralph Merkel in 87. So it's quite old. And this, this paper, in this paper, he describes this kind of digital signature that is capable of sign an unlimited number of messages. And the signature size increases logarithmically as a function of the number of messages that we are signing. So the general idea is that this system is used is to use an um, infinite tree of one-time signatures. Uh, but the cool thing about this is we, we, we read this paper, and we, if you, I challenge you to, to, to Google right now Merkle trees. And Google will provide you a list of um, articles, blog posts, uh, on um, blockchain, only on blockchain. And I mean, they were introduced a long way, long way ago. So. The, the real use case of Merkle trees was, is not um, a blockchain. So those blog posts are quite wrong. First, first because they point you only to blockchain. And the second one is that they point you to the wrong paper. The, actually, actually uh, Merkle trees were introduced in 79 in Ralph Merkle's thesis, Secrecy, Authentications, and Public Key Systems. So now you know the, the right paper. So in this thesis, he presented, he talked about one-way hash functions, which we'll talk about it, and a certified digital signature. So 10 years later, this chapter of the thesis was published as a single paper, and it took 10 years. And if you follow that link over there, you, Ralph Merkel um, explains why it's it took so long, it took 10 years to publish as a single paper. So back to trees, back to Merkle trees. Merkle trees is, is a data structure uh, and it's used for efficiently summarize and verify the integrity of large sets of data. And by the time Ralph Merkle invented this structure, um, it was used for the purpose of one-time signatures and authenticated public key distribution. Namely, you are able to provide authenticated responses to, to validate a given certificate. So a Merkle tree looks like this. Raise your hand if you know binary trees. Of okay, course, cool. it looks pretty similar, right? Uh, the only difference is that the Merkle tree is pointing to data blocks that represents a given file. So at the bottom, you have data blocks and the, the goal of the Merkle tree is to produce a Merkle root at the top, as you can see. And the Merkle root is super important. It's a crucial piece of data because it allows computers to verify, again, 
to verify the information with incredible speed and efficiency. So at this point, we know and we are able to identify the two main purposes of Merkle trees. The first one is to summarize large sets of data, and the second one is to verify that a specific piece of data belongs to a larger data set. So we are using a Merkle tree to verify that a single piece of data belongs to it. So Ralph Merkle introduced uh, and talked about uh, one-way hash functions, and a one-way hash function, if you remember a uh, talk from yesterday, um, is a function f that is easy to compute but super difficult to invert, and looks something like this. So you have inputs on the left and outputs on the right. And in the middle, you have a function, a pure function. You can call it multiple times with the same inputs, and it will always, out, uh, it will always return the same output. So, so given the input and the function in this case, it's easy to compute the output. But if you take the output and the function, it is very, very, very hard or even impossible to compute the, the input. So they are pretty powerful and useful um, in Merkle trees for two obvious reasons. The first one is storage and the second one is privacy. Regarding storage, when we have a system that contains massive amounts of data, the benefits of being able to store and identify data with a fixed length output can create vast storage savings, right? Because we, we, if, you, if, we, if you create the storage savings, it helps us to increase efficiency, and that's very cool. And the second one about privacy, if, if a given person computes the output given an input, it takes a function and computes the output, only that person knows the input, right? So if you publish the, 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 the output, the input, sorry, yeah, uh, the output, yeah. Uh, only, the, only the person that calculates the, the output knows the input. So you can, you can choose to reveal the input or keep it. So moving forward from one-way hash functions to one-time signatures, uh, this, this concept was introduced also in 79, but this time by Leslie Lambert. Um, he published this concept of one-time signatures, and most signature schemes rely in part of on one-way one hash functions, as, as we talked about. And they rely on this for their security proof. And the beauty of this Lambert scheme is that this signature is only relying on the security of these one-way one -way functions. Although, um, these one-time signatures are practical between a single pair of users who are willing to exchange large amounts of data, um, but they are quite not practical for most applications without further refinements. You have to tweak it, tweak the, the, the process. Imagine that we have a thousand messages uh, to be signed, and to be public. Um, so this process of signing uh, and publish this, these messages will, will, need, will need about 20 million bits or 2.5 megabytes uh, to store this public information. You may think that, oh, that, that's not that much. Uh, this is, is quite inexpensive, but if, you, if, if the user B had to keep this 2.5 megabytes for another thousand users, it will mean that we'll have to store 2.5 gigabytes of data. And if you keep increasing the number of users or even the number of messages that each user wants to, to sign, the system will, will eventually become a problem. And Ralph Merkel uh, detected this problem, and at this time it focused on how to eliminate these huge storage requirements in the Lambert uh, scheme and proposed an improved one-time signature with the goal to reduce the size of silent messages by almost a factor of two. So huge improvements. And as you might see, 
the new method was called tree authentication. Because the computation of the root, the root hash, or the Merkle root, forms a binary tree of recursive calls. So by using this method, we, have, we, we end up by having less transmissions. And if you look closer into the algorithm, you will, you'll eventually, um, it, will eventually, it will eventually reveal that half of, of those transmissions are actually redundant. So, you know the basic building blocks of, of a Merkle root or of a Merkle tree. So let's let's dive into on how we can compute the Merkle roots or the root of, of the tree. So let's assume that we have a, a file, and we we can divide this file in two data blocks, L1 and L2. The first thing that we have to do is to compute the hash of L1, and the second one, the, the second thing that we must do is to compute the hash function of L2. And eventually we'll have two, two leaves with, with hash values. So the next step is to take those leaves and concatenate them together and apply the same one way hash function once again. So it will look something like this. We take the both hashes, we concatenate them and apply the, apply the same one way hash function once again. So this will lead us to a Merkle tree with two data blocks, two leaves, and a node, which is the Merkle root. So the purpose of this solid was what it was to present Merkle trees and a bit of Elixir. Uh, who knows Elixir? Cool. So who doesn't know, please don't freak out. It's very, very, very simple. So we know the building blocks of a Merkle tree. And the first one is a leaf. A leaf should contain the hash value and should point to a given data block. So we can, compute, we can create this in Elixir by defining a new module leaf and a structure that contains two properties, a hash and a value, the data block value. And both of them, for this purpose, will be strings. The next step is to, to create a node. And as you can see, a node has a hash value it has both left and child hashes, uh, left and right child. Um, so we can create a new node uh, and define a struct with three properties, hash, left, and right. In this case, the hash will be a string as well, and left and right can be either a node or a leaf, depending on the, the tree, uh, on the depth of our tree. So in this case, the node is also the Merkle root. So we can, we can create um, a new module, Merkle tree, which has a single, a single which is a single struct with, um, which is a struct with a single property root, and the root is also a node. So the next step is to take the hash, to take the data blocks, and apply the one-way hash functions to them. For that, we'll need to create um, a cryptographic module with an hash function that is responsible for encoding our input. So you give it a data block, and it gives us uh, the encoded uh, data block. Um, and by creating a new function that accepts data blocks, we should be able to hash the values and convert them into leaves. So basically, that's what we are doing here. We are accepting a list of blocks. And for each block, we'll apply um, the hash function. We'll apply the, uh, sorry, we'll apply the hash function and with that hash function, we'll create a leaf, which is, the build function is just like that. You pass a value and a hash, and it will return a leaf. So if you call merkle3.new with this kind of input, a list of data blocks L1 and L2, the output will be something like this. It will be a list of leaves that contain the value and the hash, uh, the corresponding hash. So, we have leaves, but now we, we, we want to go up to the root. So we, we, need to, we need to take a pair of leaves and create a node. So we can do that by adding a new function that, that accepts a list of nodes, or in this case, a pair of nodes, or a list of two elements. Um, we take the nodes, and we take the hashes from the nodes, or in this case, the leaves, and we join them together, and 
we apply the same one-way hash function once again. So the thing we, we, we saw earlier, now it's representing by code. And once we have the hash value, we call the build function that will, that will pass the hash value, the left and the right childs, and we'll compute a new node. So at this time, you, we take the, the previous output and we call the new function in node, and the result will be something like this. We have a new node with a given hash and both left and right leaves. So it's pretty simple to build a Merkle tree, but we are handling uh, small data blocks or small files. If, if, if we increase the, the file size or the data blocks, the number of data blocks, we'll eventually need to build a bigger tree. So given that we have a file represented by a set of blocks, L1, L2, L3, and L4, we'll, we are able to use recursion, or we need to use recursion to calculate the root value of our Merkle tree. So the first step is to compute is to process um, data blocks and convert them into leaves. We know at this point how to do this. And the next step is to take the pair of leaves and create a new node. We also know how to do this. The thing we don't know how to do this, how to do yet, is to have a pair of nodes and compute another node. So that, and at this point, that's where the recursion will, will uh, be needed. So, we need a way to build a node, a pair of nodes, and again, we'll have to use recursion to calculate this, the nodes up to the Merkle root. So we have this new function that is yielding a list of leaves at this point. We'll have to extend this function to return us uh, the Merkle root. And for that, we'll have a new function build, I call it this function build, that is receiving list of nodes, we are, chunk, we are chunking the list of nodes every two elements. So as you, as you saw um, earlier, we have a list of things, in this case, a list of strings, and if you chunk every two elements, we'll have something like this. We'll have a list of lists with two elements, or a list of pairs of nodes. So, for each pair of nodes, we'll use them, use the ha their hashes to compute another node. And we'll call the build function once again. But you notice that we, have, we are making use of, of recursion. In this case, tail recursion, we are calling the same function once again uh, in order to build our Merkle tree from the ground up to the root. But still, we'll need to stop this recursive processing. That's why Elixir uh, enable us to, to do this, we are pattern matching a single element in the list of nodes. So every time we call the build function and we pass an argument that is a list and contains a single element, this means that we reach the top of our tree. And in this case, we know the root value and we are able to compute a Merkle tree with the proper root. So in the end, the final new function will look something like this. It will accept a list of blocks. It will, it will, <laughs> it will, um, so, okay. Uh, so we have a list of blocks and for each list of, for each block, we'll apply the hash function and create a leaf and we'll, we'll call the build function that will process this uh, recursively. So, again, back to the beginning. If we call the Merkle tree new function with this kind of input of uh, L1 and L2, it will lead us to this. It will compute a Merkle tree with a proper root, which is nothing more than a node, contains a hash value, a left leaf, and also a right leaf. So, that's basically it. We can with this kind of algorithm and this kind of implementation, we can have as much as data blocks as we want. So we know that Merkle trees can be used to verify that a specific data uh, piece of data belongs to a layer larger data set. And we can use this kind of thing, this audit proof 
or Merck allowed it proof, uh, which is the missing nodes required to compute all of the nodes between the data block and the Merkle root. And when we have this audit proof and we compute the root, if, if, if this audit proof fails to produce a root hash that matches the original root, it means that our data block is not present in the tree. Otherwise, it, if, it, if it computes us the, um, the same root hash, it means that that's, that piece of data block exists in our tree. So, in this example, we, are, we need to provide the proof that the data block L1 exists in the tree. We know that having the hash, the hash function, we are able to calculate the hash value of L1. And in order to compute P1, we'll need to ask for H2. And when we have H2, we, we know how to compute the P1. And when we have the P1, we'll need P2 to compute the root. And yeah, when we have P1 and P2, we know how to compute the root. So the use of this tree authentication, I hope, I hope is, is fairly clear. And a given user A transmits the root to another user B. That's the main purpose of this. And A then transmits the authentication path for L1, which is a list of the required nodes to compute the root. In this case, it's a list of H2 and P2. And since the, the user B knows the root, it can use this how did proof in order to compute the root. So we know how to build a Merkle root, but how Merkle trees are useful in the real world. And I have to say that they are especially useful in distributed peer-to-peer -peer systems where the same data should exist in multiple places. So imagine that we have a data file represented by a data structure. We are able to detect inconsistencies between replicas of the, that same tree. Take, for example, these three replicas of the same Merkle tree. At a given point in time, the repair coordinator will ask the three replicas to fetch, to, it will ask, give me your state. And instead of each replica sends all of the database state, the goal is to compute a Merkle root based on the database state and send it to the repair coordinator. And the repair coordinating by just comparing the root nodes, it can make sure that those trees are not the same, or in this case, there are inconsistencies between them. If you notice, replica one and replica two have the values L1 and L2, and replica three as L1 and L3. So in order to compare the state of these two nodes, they, the replicas will exchange the corresponding Merkle trees by levels. And they will only descend further down if the tree, if the corresponding hashes are different. So in this case, it's H2 is different than H3, and we know that replica two is right and replica three is wrong. So, so we know at this point that there are objects which must be repaired. The next step is to replica two send the L2 to replica three. And since the, the tree is immutable, we'll have to compute once again the Merkle root. So we have L2, we compute a new hash, hash of L2, and we, we, we compute the new root, which is A, which is the same root as replica two and replica three. So at this point, the, 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 repair, the repair processing is over. And this kind of process is called anti entropy mechanism, and databases like Dynamo, React, and Cassandra use this to repair their own bad replicas. Another cool, cool use case of Merkle trees is peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Because we know that one of the principal advantages of using Merkle trees is that each branch of the tree can be checked independently without requiring nodes to download the entire data set. So imagine that you are downloading a file from a torrent file uh, from the internet. And the first step that you must do is to fetch the root of the tree from a trusted source to access a given file. And remember, you trust this source, you trust this peer. 
once you trust the peer that provided you the, um, the Merkle root, you can now fetch chunks of data from untrusted sources. And by, by fetching chunks of data, you'll, I mean, you'll only have to, to download or fetch um, chunks of data that you require. So you, you, you fetch the L3 data, data block, and you know the hash function, and you know how to calculate the L3 hash function, the hash value of L3. So the next step, if you recall, uh, we talked about audit proofs. So that's basically it. The, those untrusted sources or untrusted peers will have to send you the audit proof, which is something like this. And if the root computed from the audit path matches the true roots of the, of your, of the tree and of your file, then it means that the audit path is proof that the data block that you fetched from an untrusted source exists in the tree. So it means that your file that you downloaded is legit as the peer that provided you. Another cool use case of Merkle trees is copy and write. And copy and write um, data structures are called persistent data structures because they keep the old versions. So you keep adding um, things to your data, st data structure and the old version is always preserved. So imagine like you are, you are providing a, you have an API and you change the contract, you keep bumping the versions. The copy and write data structures is basically the same. You, you change things and you have a new version but you always keep the old versions. So imagine this tree. It's a com pretty com a complete tree and computed already. And at a given point in time, you will update the L4 data block. And again, since they are immutable, you'll have to compute the, the root hash once again. So you compute the hash value of L4, you compute this parent node hash, and we'll have to compute a new root. So, but look at the left. All of, all of the data blocks and nodes and leaves that, and the data blocks could potentially be gigabytes of data are untouched. So the cool thing on, uh, about copy on, copy on write is instead of taking a full copy, we can share the same tree between both the copy and the original tree. And it will look something like this. Every time you are updating something, in this case we updated L4, we created a new, a new data block and we created th three new nodes. And all of the rest of the tree is intact. So, so this, 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 this means that we can save lots of data. And it will mean it will look something like this. Our tree, after we update it, it will have the version one, which is the original version, and the version two with a new data block and three new nodes, and it is reusing the the things from version one. This is really, really, really cool. So in order to wrap up, just want you to remember these things from Merkle trees. Um, you must remember that Merkle trees are just binary trees that contains infinite number of crypto cryptographic hashes. And Merkle trees contains leaves, and each leaf contains ashes of data blocks. On the other hand, we have nodes which sits above the leaves and contains ashes of their own children. And Eventually, with data blocks, leaves, and nodes, they will produce a root hash that will summarize an entire data set and it's publicly distributed uh, around the network. That's the, m the main goal of, of Merkle trees. And we know that with Merkle trees, we can easily prove that a given data block exists in the tree. That's very, very, very neat. So you, if you are, curious about this, you can find, and if you are curious in diving even deeper in Merkle trees, 
You can find them in, in Cassandra, IPFS, React, uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and OpenZFS, and lots, lots of more implementations of Merkle trees. And if you are, if you like to read papers or somehow convince you to start reading papers, you have lots of things to choose, but I will recommend you to, to start with these uh, papers by Ralph Merkel, where, which are the original papers of, of, of Merkle trees. So yeah, that's it for me. That's all I have for, for you, so yeah, gracias. <laughs>